And really it does boil down to this question of what is it that we are doing when we preserve something? And what I immediately became aware of was how very specific uh, the context of the United States is. The United States is a bizarre aberration in comparison with what the rest of the world uh, and throughout the rest of history has been the normal situation. Um, and it helped me realize that this thing we call historic preservation is kind of a very strange thing that it's not the opposite of modern development. It's in a way the flip side of the same coin. It's only because, and I should probably set this to not turn off every two minutes. It's only because we pretend that human history ended and we started over from scratch in the modern era it's only in the context of pretending that this is a unique moment in history that historic preservation is, becomes what it is, which is uh, historic preservation used to be the norm. It used to be just what we did. It was common sense that if you have a building, you maintain it and you make it, you keep it its useful life. You extend its useful life as long as you can. Uh, almost like it's almost like the human body it's common sense that we take care of ourselves and try to extend our own lives as long as possible but it's only in the bizarre situation of capitalism in the modern era especially as seen in the United States that we need to do this special thing that is historic preservation and I think you've studied at length things like uh, Pennsylvania Station in New York City as a catalyst for rallying uh, the forces of the preservation movement. And so um, the reason this perspective was necessary is by my uh, strange and unlikely arrival, uh, almost it seemed like a landing on another planet um, in this city called Solo. Uh, it's a royal city. Uh, of Surakarta. I saw that in the syllabus there was a reading. Yeah. I'm not I'm sure curious. if the reading was read. I won't put you on the spot and quiz yeah, you on it. Must, yeah. We should have. Yeah. No, I'll... We should have, yeah, we should have asked. I, should yeah, I put ask. them on the spot? Probably not. Okay. Not sure. All right. I'll leave it up to Did you. Did anyone read the reading? Oh, you are going to put them on the spot. Well, I'm going to suggest that after this class you do read Maybe we could talk about it next time as well, okay? But um, the, uh, the things that I encountered were so surprising and shocking uh, because I was so unprepared. I did not take a class like this. I went to architecture school. I graduated from architecture school uh, with a certain set of questions, and maybe we'll get into that. But the, 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 the big idea that I think this experience provokes is the question, uh, whenever we set out to treat uh, heritage in a specific way, how do we decide what to do with it? Uh, and this is a situation where it broke all the rules of historic preservation as we seem to experience it in the United States, not unlike the Issei Shrine. It, uh, sometimes the most appropriate thing to do is to do the opposite of what you were trained to do. Uh, and the only reason I was able to do that is because I wasn't trained to do anything in terms of historic preservation. I stumbled onto a situation that uh, required action and um, this is, in a way, the story of the actions that were required of me, forcing me to take a different approach to historic preservation. Um, scenes like this that uh, appears to uh, hearken from an earlier age, you know, this could be, this photograph could 
be 100 years old, uh, but it's not. It was taken in 1994. Uh, but the same ritual has been performed for uh, hundreds of years. Um, the journey started in, when I was in architecture school. I was trying to figure out what was so great about Lucan's Salk Institute. And there are so many things that were great about it. Um, and I started out thinking what was so great was the structural system that allowed the mechanicals, uh, all that stuff that we see in the ceiling here, to be on a separate floor. And so the laboratory space below could be uncluttered with all that. And I thought that was very innovative and it was, they was able to do that because of a structural system. Or the location of the offices at a slightly offset floor and section, that was pretty cool. But what I really boiled down to was the space. The space itself is really the most magical, almost sacred portion of this building. And I was confronted with, by the question, this project confronted me with the question, uh, as it does many people, how is it that this space is so remarkable? What, how does that work? And if you took a garbage bag and you captured a volume of space, uh, there would be nothing special about anything in that garbage bag. It's the exact same space that you would capture if you were in a parking lot uh, on campus here. Um, and what I realized is two things make this space special. One is the way it is architecturally framed. And the second thing is the larger story of its construction and what it means. Uh, and it really is about storytelling. And what we do in architecture and what we do in preservation is really about uh, storytelling and allowing stories to be told. Certain stories can be told because of the way the architecture frames space and other stories are not. And so um, with this revelation in architecture school, I made a decision to go study uh, the space uh, in the city of Rome. And I learned Italian and was applying for grants and I was all set to go when a friend of mine disturbed my world by giving me this photograph of uh, a gate in a city in central Java, the city of Solo, um, where there was this, uh, basically a noble, a, a noble person's mansion in this one part of town. And it was a courtyard arrangement uh, buried deep in the high density fabric of the, the city, not unlike Rome. But whereas Rome has a long history of thousands, tens of thousands of architects and non-architects um, writing about it and studying it and examining it, um, there were, were something like three people in the world who had written about this uh, in English. And the rest was inaccessible. And it sparked my interest enough to study Indonesian. Uh, and I immediately forgot all my Italian, which I still regret. Um, but I studied Indonesian, got a three-month grant, and got on the airplane and went. And uh, Indonesia uh, is this collection of islands that are left, are really 400 or so different nations and cultures and languages and ethnicities. Um, that were brought together under Dutch colonial rule for three centuries and stayed together in the form of uh, Indonesia after World War II. Uh, and I'd like to show it in this map because it shows population densities. It shows these very high zones of population in northern India, well, throughout India, uh, China, the coastal region of China in particular, Japan, and then the island of Java, which is the dominant cultural group of the nation state of Indonesia. You may be more familiar with Bali. It's just that little island there is Bali. Uh, but Java is really the cultural demographic powerhouse of Indonesia. Um, and there's a more familiar mapping of the area. <clears throat> a very uh, under-recognized under, uh, part of the world, especially 
for people growing up in the United States. Uh, it seems to be very much ignored, despite the fact that it is the uh, fourth largest country in the world. China, India, uh, the United States, and Indonesia. Uh, and especially the population concentration on the island of Java, <clears throat> which is dominated by volcanoes, which very early on led to very rich soils, the occasional eruptions of the volcanoes, deposits ash, which accounts for very rich agricultural lands, high population density, early development of uh, complex societies, a classical artistic culture, uh, and the city of Jakarta at the time of my arrival in the 1990s uh, with uh, very much uh, familiar traffic jams and glass and steel towers um, uh, ruled by the military dictator, uh, the smiling general Suharto until 1998, but also home to um, some of the great monuments of the world, the largest Buddhist uh, stupa in the world of Borobudur, uh, not far away from one of the largest Hindu uh, complexes at Prambanan, um, all under the tutelage of a series of kings, uh, Javanese kings, um, that uh, were responsible for the maintenance of order, not just here on earth, but create a, maintaining a balance between heaven and earth. This is the Hindu Javanese um, cosmological model, uh, the conception of the cosmos as a series, as a, as a sacred island, the home of the gods at the center, with rings, uh, rings of continents uh, emanating out uh, and a vast ocean beyond the seven ringed continents. Um, and the primary instrument of maintaining the balance between heaven and earth is the palace complex itself. Um, and when I arrived in the city of Solo, all I knew about was this one house uh, that was interesting to me. And uh, when I got over my jet lag and woke up in the morning and started talking to people, they said, well, this house is uh, a smaller version of the palace. And I said, palace? Um, the house in question is uh, this one here. Um, and, and they said, yeah, palace. Go out and turn right uh, a few times, and you'll come to the palace. So I walked along, and I got to the front entrance to the palace. I walked around these walls and arrived at this front gate. And I met a man um, who I thought of as being Mr. Depot. Uh, but it turns out he was really uh, um, Pangiran Depot Kusumo, who was a prince. And when I, when I found out he was a prince, I said, there are princes? And he said, well, of course. There are 36 princes and princesses. There's a king, and there are, he has six wives. And uh, we are the royal family. And I said, no way. Royal family? This was all a shock to me. And um, my three-month tour of research was changed by the fact that I had access to a single, at that time, a single aerial photograph, which all of a sudden allowed me to try to figure out how the palace operated. The architecture itself was actually quite modest, of wood structures that were slowly decaying and falling to pieces. Um, but it was really this larger religious function of maintaining the balance between heaven and earth that it turns out was still going on. The king, his primary job now that there was a president of Indonesia, um, since he, uh, 1942 when the Japanese in invaded, this king when he was 12 years old uh, was kind of dethroned. He was no longer the king of Java, he was now um, a ceremonial figurehead um, uh, under Japanese rule, uh, which actually was a very gradual transition because the Dutch had already undermined his authority. But here's this palace. You can see it's uh, in need of some loving care, but these people are still enacting rituals constantly, even as the building itself is falling apart around them. Uh, barely being held together. This is actually a sacred structure 
uh, moved here from the palace prior to this palace uh, in 1745. Uh, the main buildings of the palace were disassembled, not unlike Yisei Shrine, uh, not totally unlike, but the, the sacred buildings of the palace of, of Kartasuro were disassembled, arranged in a, a procession so that the cosmological order of the palace was never broken. The parade itself maintained the structure, the cosmological model of the universe uh, as it moved uh, 20 kilometers to the new location of Surakarta in the city of Solo, or near the village of Solo at the time, which has subsequently become the royal city of Surakarta. And so the old palace, the center of the palace was erected here um, and barely kept uh, upright. Um, and as the new palace was built around it in 1745, uh, and this palace, uh, maintained a mixture of beliefs in the Queen of the South Seas, um, overlaid with a Hindu uh, religious overlay, Buddhism, and then in the, since the 12th century, uh, Islam came into play. And uh, this model of the Hindu cosmology uh, is mapped out, and it's not just a, a metaphor, it is considered to be an instrument of maintaining the balance by performing certain rituals at certain locations of the palace, uh, they would uh, restore balance. For example, if there was a famine off to the far uh, west of the island of Java, that area would correspond with uh, certain places within the inner palace wall. And so a, a a ritual performed and an offering given over in this portion of the palace would restore balance uh, in that far off village. And so the crops would come back, or at least that's uh, the story that this architecture allowed to be told. And so even though they lost their uh, sources of wealth and income after independence, they let the buildings crumble and whatever money they did have, they invested in the uh, ongoing cycle of rituals. Now, the other interesting thing that you can start to see in this photo is this bizarre combination of cultural influences. You see sarongs around the waist, but these tailcoats and medals that are Dutch in origin, uh, the pith helmets that look like a comical, uh, farcical emulation of British colonial costumes, uh, spears, and there are rifles and brass bands. Um, and uh, it's a demonstration of the Javanese capacity to absorb cultural influences that I write about in the um, reading uh, quite extensively and Javanize them. The, the key verb uh, in this is the Javanese language equivalent of Javanization. And so these, uh, there was a king, number 10, Pacubuono X, in the 19th century, who was a big fan of the Baroque and the grotesque. And so he um, rebuilt the palace uh, in several ways to uh, emulate the style and custom of uh, European Baroque and made it Javanese. Um, and that process of Javanization of uh, e uh, external cultural elements continues. Um, and one of the way these things are javanized is through the, these rituals. And this is one of the rituals, uh, the ritual cleaning of the sacred canon. Now the canon was made in Portugal and um, captured by the Javanese uh, in a battle over Jakarta uh, and have sacred have come to hold sacred uh, meaning. And one of the canons is stored in this shrouded pavilion, glass pavilion, and no one is allowed to see this except for the king himself and a priest who engages in a ritual cleaning three times a year. And this ritual cleaning uh, involves uh, first starting with a canon and then washing the entire building uh, from the inside out, moving to the, and there's the priest cleaning the, uh, the shaft of the cannon. 
And uh, as the water is swept off the floor, uh, these women scramble with their plastic bottles to capture some of this water. And if their children get sick, they uh, sprinkle some of this water in their rice. Uh, if the crops start to fail, they uh, put some of this water in the, in the rice fields. Uh, and down to the last drop, this is uh, wringing out the, the rags into a funnel, into a jug to capture that water. Another ritual ceremony is um, this one where the, um, the linga and yoni, uh, symbols of male and female genitalia that comes out of Hindu religious practice, is here uh, constructed in food offerings, uh, paraded from the center of the palace out to the mosque. Uh, and so you, you're seeing an interesting uh, hybridization of Islam, Hinduism, uh, and the uh, syncretic pre-Hindu belief systems uh, that refer to the Queen of the South Sea, along with the uh, with a little bit of Indonesian nationalism thrown in with the national flag fluttering from these offerings. Uh, and once the sacred essence has been uh, consumed in the mosque, they, the offerings are pulled out of the mosque and the crowd tears them to pieces uh, with a frantic uh, competition because these, each part of these offerings carries a sacred value and it allows them to uh, deal with crises that might uh, confront their family. Um, one of the more telling rituals uh, that I uh, was able to participate in is the, uh, the Javanese New Year ceremony where the the volunteer servants of the king, and there are several thousand of them, uh, they wear these ribbons when they enter the palace as a signal to the Queen of the South Seas that they are a friend of the family. And uh, they are not an enemy invader, they are part of the family of the palace, and so uh, they enter uh, in support of the king and his family uh, during the afternoon of the New Year's Eve celebration. Uh, the villagers walk in from all over and they walk. Uh, it's part of the uh, belief system that they should walk in. And they line the streets uh, waiting for the parade of sacred objects. And uh, we wait around until the king is ready. And he is inside the inner sanctuary of the palace consulting his priests, identifying which of the sacred objects uh, held in the reliquary of the palace should be paraded around the palace. They look at what went wrong uh, in the previous year and they also make predictions about what challenges the, the kingdom is going to face in the coming year. And based on that, to correct things that went wrong and to guard against things that are predicted to go wrong, they choose certain objects, certain sacred objects. And those objects are shrouded uh, so that no one can see what they are uh, because they don't want to have people making guesses about what the predictions are uh, based on what objects are paraded around the palace. And so the objects uh, shrouded in, in sacred cloths and these flowers are then um, taken in a procession that is led by a, white, uh, a herd of white buffalo. Um, and when the white buffalo uh, stop, the whole procession stops. And when the white buffalo uh, proceed, everybody uh, starts walking again. And if the white buffalo start galloping, then everyone lifts up their skirts and starts to trot along behind to keep up. And when the white buffalo pee on the streets, uh, the people break ranks and they soak up the pee with their sarongs. And when the buffalo defecate, they scoop it up and take it home because this is sacred stuff. Um, this palace uh, relic was a gift from the Queen of the Netherlands and uh, it has taken on a very sacred function in the palace hierarchy over the, the decades. Uh, it has given uh, the sacred name of Kyai um, Chen, uh, Kenchoro uh, and it is a sacred uh, object of uh, offerings every Thursday night to maintain the balance of power 
uh, between heaven and earth. Here's the sacred uh, marching band with its Middle Eastern fez and its Baroque architecture um, playing an off-key um, march uh, with the Dutch tailcoats uh, with the tails clipped off so that the Javanese short sword can be worn in the, uh, in the back uh, as required. Now when I, uh, as I was studying all of these interesting complexes of rituals that were being uh, still maintained to the present day uh, quite enthusiastically by uh, the people of Java. Uh, I was also uh, collaborating with the local university who had been given the task of developing a preservation plan for the palace. And the preservation plan was not just for preservation, it was also for cultural tourism. And uh, they looked around the world at best practices and they decided that the Williamsburg, Virginia model was the highest and best uh, model to emulate. And when this uh, guy, this architect from the United States arrived, they said, oh, you can help us with this. You're an American. You know all about this stuff. And um, you know what, where we're coming from. You understand this model and you can help us implement it most effectively. And, uh, and so, uh, and you know all about this, like, um, where the building practices are actually part of uh, how you do this. And so they had mapped out, and that's not a very good, but they had mapped out uh, a reuse plan for every part of the palace, including um, parts of the palace that were so sacred that uh, I, was, I was given I, over the months, I was uh, gradually gained the trust of the royal family, and they gave me access to almost the entire palace. Uh, but there were certain areas that I didn't have access to, one of them being um, what uh, probably translates as the harem. This is where the king's uh, wives uh, live, and uh, and the small children, and when the boys reach puberty, they need to leave the harem and go live someplace else. Uh, and no one is really allowed in. And so I never went in there, but the team from the uh, university went right in with uh, the authority of the Minister of Culture and Tourism uh, and Education and uh, photographed and documented the harem and made a plan for this harem to be converted into a five-star hotel. And the tower, the sacred tower of, uh, devoted to the Queen of the South Sea would be an observation platform. And the sacred library would become a gift shop and this hall would become a movie theater. Uh, and so every space in the palace had a, a new function to satisfy uh, the tourist model. The royal family would of course have to leave the palace. And, be, and live somewhere else, but in order to satisfy the requirements of the Williamsburg, Virginia model, the um, actors and actresses would be called in to play the role of the royal family. And this would be, this is the old Dutch fortress that would be redeveloped as a shopping mall and hotel. And so every part of these, um, this core of the city would be, um, reconstructed as a golden triangle of uh, tourism development. And um, uh, and the, um, and I said, my response was, well, uh, if, if it were like the United States, if the tourists, if uh, the original residents of Williamsburg, Virginia, um, if, like in Williamsburg, the original residents had lost all connection to the place, then uh, that would be a great plan for the palace in Solo. But the fact is that uh, if the Rockefeller family had access to the uh, descendants of the original settlers who were still maintaining some aspect of the life of the original settlers, then the, the developers uh, of Williamsburg, Virginia would have jumped at the opportunity
to nurture and uh, fan the sparks of remaining embers of this original living culture and try to maintain them as much as possible into the future. Um, and that is probably the appropriate approach here at the palace. Um, I'm going to skip this example. Um, it doesn't quite fit. Um, and I gave the example of the Issei Shrine. Uh, that um, the important thing about the Issei Shrine, uh, the way I presented it to the royal family, the people at the university, uh, and eventually to uh, the students who were protesting this transformation of the palace. Uh, and the, there were three princesses who threatened to go on a hunger strike if this plan proceeded. And, uh, and so the discussions that ensued uh, did hinge around the Issei Shrine uh, as an example of a physical architecture that is most, in, the most important aspect of this is its role in maintaining uh, a living cultural tradition uh, that the, the historic preservation culture of Japan recognizes national treasures of both tangible and intangible heritage. And so there are physical monuments like there are in the rest of the world, but there are also uh, people who are recognized by the national government of Japan as being the, uh, the, the figures that are maintaining the intangible cultural heritage of Japan. And uh, in that spirit, the Issei Shrine is really an instrument, uh, a focal point for the maintenance of the forest, of the landscape, of the, uh, the craft traditions, of this community of people who maintain the living culture of uh, the, the rituals of Shintoism that revolve around the care and renewal of the shrine itself. And so uh, the, the value, and this harkens back to uh, the reading you had early in the semester of uh, Alois Regal and the cult of, um, of preservation, of the cult of monuments, the modern cult of monuments, where uh, the essence takeaway of that reading from me, and I didn't read it until I took uh, an earlier version of this class with Hassan at MIT uh, after this experience, was uh, that you first need to evaluate where the value lies. What is the source of the value in any given heritage uh, situation? And I say heritage situation rather than building. Because buildings uh, sometimes are the whole story, but often the buildings are not the whole story, and sometimes the buildings are not even half the story. Uh, and I would argue that the situation in Java is that the buildings are less than half the story. And this is, uh, I just threw this picture in of the Issei Shrine of last summer. This is a photo from Iwan Ban. Apparently he has not shared widely uh, his photos of that yet. Um, it's waiting for them to be published. Um, but this, uh, the practice of renewal uh, is really uh, as or more important, or at least integral, to the preservation of the buildings themselves. And the source, uh, in our discussions, we realized that the source of value of the palace really hinged around this man who, um, when I first met him, he was hanging out in the hotel bar, and he just seemed like an old guy flirting with the young women. Um, but it turned out he wasn't just the old guy flirting with the young women. He was also the king, uh, who, since the age of 12, had ruled um, over what was left of the ritual practices of the Javanese religion uh, called Kajawen. Uh, which was a hybrid religion uh, combining worship of the Queen of the South Seas, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, in its very strange and dynamic uh, 
syncretic hybrid agglomeration of religious practices. Uh, and when we set out to attract funding and preservation work of the palace, we did it in a way that attempted to preserve, uh, in a way that uh, we weren't aware of at the time, but preserved a lot of the uh, same type of practices that we see at the Issei Shrine. That, um, and it was interesting, there was a fire in the center of the palace in the 1980s, and the engineer who was sent to rebuild the palace assumed that it would be rebuilt not in wood, but in concrete, because that's how such things were done in the 1980s. But he quickly realized that, uh, no, this is this very sacred thing. And he learned as quickly as he could the practices of, uh, of Javanese uh, forestry, uh, the sacred rituals of tying a cloth around the trees, uh, and meditation uh, for as long as it took to uh, gain the acquiescence of the gods, of the spirits of the forest, for the harvesting of the trees. Um, this is uh, our partner. He is the priest carpenter architect uh, who was charged with the responsibility of, uh, of the renewal of the palace. And we were happily uh, first to get uh, some funding from the uh, Getty uh, grant program, which was cut short um, because of the terms and conditions of the bureaucracy of grants. Uh, but then eventually an even more generous uh, source of support in the Aga Khan uh, Award for Architecture, uh, which allowed us to proceed according to the King's agenda, which was this tower devoted to the Queen of the South Seas uh, really needed to be the top priority uh, in the renewal of the palace. And so uh, we set out to uh, using hand tools uh, to replace the decaying elements. And so here is um, Pa Asmo in his carpenter mode, and here is Pa Asmo uh, in his mode as priest and participant of the rituals during um, one of the uh, Javanese ceremonies. Uh, and before we even measured the buildings, we uh, performed the uh, required rituals of offerings. Uh, all of us wore the ribbons. We uh, brought um, the people who um, had been assigned the task of uh, maintaining the palace, but in the lack of funding, they had spent a lot of time in the capital doing hotel lobbies uh, in the palace style. And so we were happy to bring them away from the hotel lobbies and to the palace itself um, to perform their, their tasks of renewal. Um, to a large extent, um, breaking, again, breaking the rules of conservation practice. Instead of uh, doing the paint studies that identified uh, what were the original paint colors uh, at the peak of the palace culture in the 19th century, uh, we didn't just do that. We did do that. We identified certain uh, color schemes. But then we went to the current king and we said, uh, uh, if, if we were doing this somewhere else, we would restore it to its, uh, its high point, its peak of cultural significance uh, 150 years ago. But uh, uh, this palace is not dead yet. And uh, so what color, uh, we will paint it whatever color you think is appropriate. Uh, if you want it to be purple or pink or red, uh, we'll paint it those colors uh, because we defer to you. I don't think he believed us and so uh, we had to really convince him that we were willing to do whatever he said because uh, he, uh, we recognized his uh, position as the most important one. We did not want to do what had happened previously, which is where the Japanese came in, they identified a need to preserve the library. So they came in with their experts, they, in the course of three months, did all of their work, and then packed up and left, uh, leaving a very undertrained staff in charge of the library, where things sim simply started to decay uh, very rapidly. And we were, um, committed to not allowing that to happen. 
And so we were trying to invest not just in the physical capital of the palace and restore it and leave. We were focused on the physical palace as an exercise, as an instrument, as a focal point that would allow us to empower the hierarchy of the palace officials to return to the task of managing and maintaining their palace uh, for their own purposes on their own without uh, dependence on outside uh, uh, assistance. And so um, uh, that was the focus appropriately, we thought, um, of the work we did. Uh, and it was important to tell the story this way, um, that uh, rather than uh, allowing the story to be told, that we came in, we fixed it up, and then it just um, returned to its normal cycle of decay until the next outside group came in to, to do it. And uh, in my subsequent trips back, I'm happy to report that um, the, uh, the new king uh, and uh, his family, especially his daughter, his, actually his sister and brother-in-law, have been um, uh, making it a top priority to continue the process of renewal of the palace uh, physically um, as a way of keeping the continuity of this uh, tradition, um, not just the physical palace, but really the living culture. Uh, it's a very conservative way to do things because you're really uh, trying to maintain um, these, these practices uh, for the future generations even as they evolve and change in the context, in the global context, at least there is a continuity there, just as it has always been. And in the reading, one of the key points is that globalization is not a new thing. And these strategies of, of hybridization and adaptation uh, and embracing foreign influences and transforming them uh, and giving them, injecting them with new meanings is something that the Javanese have been doing since they were first exposed to global trade uh, 2,000 years ago when India and China started to uh, trade with each other passing through the ports of Java. Uh, and, this, and so these strategies of cultural adaptation that are 2,000 years old and they're highly useful uh, uh, today and moving forward. So that's that's the presentation. Hopefully, we can talk about it. Okay, thank you. Can you put the lights on? So we can, uh... when, I'm just trying to remember, when did you, oh, you went there not with the idea of restoring something, right? I went there with a three month grant to you stayed longer. get a sense of the, uh, the way space, like in the Salk Institute, gets charged with meaning, and um, ended up staying for four years. So, but, so you, so when, uh, when did you actually get involved? I mean, you were, went to see the palace, but when did they suddenly say, it needs restoration, and what about you, Bob, getting involved, as opposed to? Well, they never said that. No. I said that. <laughs> I <laughs> said, said you need to. you've really got something special here. Uh, I can help you attract funding. So it was really, and I try to tell my students now that no one's going to offer you a position, or it's rare that someone's going to say, hey, can you help us do this? Uh, more often than not, I believe, or the best opportunities are the ones where you identify the opportunity and you go to them and you say, listen, you have something, I think you have something special here. I think I'm not alone. I think a lot of people will see this as a very special opportunity to do, some, do the right thing, which is to not just restore the buildings, but have the process of restoring the buildings be the focal point of galvanizing a community uh, and in, uh, developing the institutional, the carrying capacity to keep it going in perpetuity. 
And it was just a bizarre coincidence that I showed up naively thinking I was going to be looking at this one house. Stumbled upon this palace and the same days uh, wandered over to the university uh, in Jogjakarta at UGM and uh, met the architects who were in the final stages of putting, dotting the T, dotting the I's and crossing the T's of a plan to make a Williamsburg, Virginia mockery of this amazing thing. And um, I was diplomatic, and these people remain some of my best friends in the world, but I helped them um, overcome the assumptions of their client, which was the Minister of Tourism in Bobby. And so I helped them to see the possibilities of an alternative approach, identified the flaws or the inappropriate nature of the Williamsburg approach, the American approach, uh, in light of the fact that this was an Issei Shrine situation, not a Williamsburg, Virginia situation. And that it's important to have the critical eye and the nuance and the sophistication to see the difference between Issei Shrine and Williamsburg, Virginia. So coming in as an outsider, but, um, you then had to say, what I've learned or what is historic preservation is about has to be subservient to what you guys believe in some ways. So you're almost asking people who are not experts, who are not involved in this process, for what should be done. So it's, it's an interesting sort of thing. Again, you know, we go in as as experts into a situation and say we know whether you're an architect or a preservationist. And we've been talking a little bit about um, who makes the decisions and how do you get into the community to get involved in the appropriate projects. Because in the old days it was you were the experts, you went in, you did your bit, decided this is the right way to do things, and that is we still do a lot of that, by the way. I think, yeah. Unfortunately. Sometimes. But maybe it's again, where does the value lie? And where, where is the value? Who lie? makes the, and uh, who do you decide? And the basic question is, what are you doing every time you restore a building? Why are you doing this thing? And maybe you say it's a beautiful building, I thought it's unique, it's a reason. But it has implicated much bigger implications on, on what we do, both culturally and even technologically, and in all sorts of other ways too. So what do you think? Any questions or thoughts? No. It just seemed crazy how they wanted to put like that whole hotel complex there. It seems crazy, but the world is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> And it's not just the decision to preserve this building or to not preserve it, or this building but not that building, but every detail. Uh, do you cut the molding and run the conduit where it wants to go? Or do you keep the molding and run the conduit around it? Or do you say, we're just not going to have air conditioning and it get rid of the conduit? Sometimes the right thing to do is cut the molding. Sometimes the right thing to do is to say, you need air conditioning. Uh, and sometimes the right thing to do is say, it would be actually decreasing the value by adding air conditioning. And every detailed decision like that really depends on what is the source of value and uh, what are you trying to amplify what do you try how do you best amplify the values that are there and um, sometimes the molding was added later uh, at a point at a moment in history that was not a source of value and so you cut them but sometimes the most important moment is right now and you you make decisions based on 
where those values are. And I think that's at the core of what Regal was saying. And it's remarkable how valid what he wrote so long ago remains today. Good way to go about restoration or not. Also for visibility. Would you call this good practices? You would? I think so. Why? Because because I'm too tired of all the reason. Still gotta do it. That's not a good enough reason. You still gotta do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's called school. Because yeah. it's not destroying anything, it's just So are you suggesting that restoration destroys things? I didn't say that today. Bad practices destroy things. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I have so an this example. Because it doesn't destroy things. Bad yeah. practice does. I see, it's a bad practice for you to destroy I, I have an example. That better. <laughs> I got it. That I skipped over. Um, that we. Thank you, Guru. Yeah, this is for the night. Um, the main, one of the main uh, figures in all this which is Prince Deepo Kusumo, who I write about in the, in the, in the reading. Um, one of the examples I always used with him was air conditioning, like I did here. Um, this was a glass pavilion that was built, uh, re rebuilt in 1998 after being destroyed in a fire in 1984. And this is a project that um, Yubave, after the Minister of Tourism and Culture, after retiring, um, from being a minister, organized funding and actually from his personal wealth uh, funded the, the reconstruction of this pavilion. And uh, so it was not managed by me or anyone of my team in the palace. And uh, it needed to be air conditioned because it was this glass dining hall. And when it's 98 degrees out every day, um, they, there was, uh, they, they decide, they made the decision to put in air conditioning. And I had, um, talked with, uh, uh, Prince Deepo Kusumo about, uh, different kinds of air conditioning units. And I was always favoring this kind that conceivably, it doesn't show it here, but conceivably, um, sure if there's an interior shot. Conceivably could be concealed in a structural element uh, in, the, in, the, in the ceiling. That if you are careful about how you do the structure, because they use structural steel in this concealed in the wood. Uh, if you do it carefully, um, I was suggesting that a small air conditioning unit could be incorporated into uh, this arrangement without putting these tombstone elements uh, along the wall. And, um, and so it was decisions like that uh, that I was always using as an example of doing alternatives to the straightforward, treating this like a development project approach and actually preserving some sense of the, uh, the ambiance as much as possible. And so, um, but this is a totally new building, right? This is a totally new building uh, based on the historic yeah, record, the photographs before the fire in 1984. Um, and here's something that uh, I also, uh, this is not my design for the etched glass, but this is um, the symbol, the crest, of the palace, renewed and updated slightly um, to be um, 
and it's upside down for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, the Paco Buono the Twelfth, so it's P B twelve and the crest, and um, and so that's that's referring to the current at that point the current king. Uh, and so is that proper practice um, or not? In the context of the United States, it would be questionable. Uh, it wouldn't be preservation at all, because it refers to the present moment in time. It might not, people might claim, uh, and I think reasonably so, that this isn't preservation. This is postmodernism. Yeah, building a historic moment, basically. Yeah. And so, where does this fall? And I would say, um, it depends. It depends on the decision of this chandelier. Like, who is choosing that chandelier? Uh, it looks like it's from Home Depot. But at the same time, these columns are cast steel columns uh, mm -hmm. replicated from the original forms of the Dutch cast iron columns uh, from 200 years earlier. And so, in the end, it's a very interesting mix. The carved panels, uh, the carved panels, these young men are not part of the royal team. The brother-in-law of the current king uh, had a development company that he ran uh, in the town and he brought in his workers. They were not trained under the traditional system of royal carving, um, but they were cheaper. And so I criticized this uh, as being uh, an unnecessary shortcut that undermines the value, uh, ultimately, uh, as does this. I said, if you want to give these donors the greatest bang for their buck, you will not carve their names in the entry door, because this undermines the value of the end result rather than what you intend. But the donors obviously won't, let's say, be funded for you to be recognized, right? So, from a d donor point of view, if they didn't get some sort of recognition, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have done it. Do right. So yeah. But it could have been, uh, it could have been, if it was seen as an important factor, it could have been done in the tourist, yeah. uh, in the interpretation materials, rather than in the physical fabric itself. So there seem to be, what this reflects is less of an interest in um, having this building uh, operate in harmony with its surroundings. Uh, when this pavilion was rebuilt after the fire, it was done by uh, the engineer that I mentioned, who insisted that the priests or he went to bat, he said, listen, uh, we are not going to rebuild this pavilion in concrete emulating wood. How many opportunities do we have to build a palace, a sacred temple of the Javanese religion? We are obligated, this generation and this nation is obligated to rebuild it according to the, whatever it takes to maintain the possibility of becoming infused with spiritual meaning for this population. And um, uh, when I arrived, I was told that in the first few years after it was rebuilt, they did not deposit the, they kept the sacred items elsewhere. And they needed to await for the spiritual value to accumulate in the building. And that they didn't know how many years it was going to take, but the priests would know when it was time. And so after something like 12 years uh, of accumulation of spiritual value, the sacred elements, the sacred objects were moved into it, and the rituals were performed every year, and 
according to the cycle, cycle of rituals. And so that building accumulated all of the sacred value in the eyes of the, the true believers that were necessary. Um, but the question is now, and I'd be interested to hear what you, you all feel. Um, let's just talk about the carving. Uh, does it allow, to what extent is this architectural uh, outcome available to accrue spiritual value? And to what extent, um, like what would the priests say? Would they say it's going to take longer? Would they say it's impossible? Or would they say it's no problem at all? And I don't know what, what you think based on what you heard in the story. Yeah. It's probably, I would think no problem that the other one was able to gain spiritual 12 years. I mean, it might take a while, but it could still happen. Mm -hmm. who, who agrees? Who disagrees? Somewhat. Uh, some more degree? Uh, How would you alter it? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm like torn between whether it would matter or whether it would be longer mm -hmm. because it's altered with things like those etches that you showed us. But I don't really know. I guess I don't know how to wrap it. So. <laughs> because you'd say, well, these practices are okay. Yeah. They still use something that. I don't know how much this refers to these screens. Well, they obviously do, do carve wood, and they do have the screens. Uh, may not have been done through the same ritual, but this, uh, the etched glass is probably not something they, I don't know if they did that in the past or not, probably not, but uh, maybe they did. So if there's I some can't new, remember. If there's some new additions. There's certainly stained glass all over the place. Yeah. some new additions, would that be okay? And this is back to this question about... And so how about this air condition? How's that? Does that change it at all? A little bit, but it also makes the space more functional. Yeah. So it could be used all the time instead of just when it's cooler. And probably not quite as ugly as what is what's inside it, right? Right. So yes, yeah. it could have left it uncovered. So. How many actual air conditioning units are in that space? Um, I think there's a bunch of them on the wall. A lot. Yeah. yeah. If you look at that, just about. They're probably you know sort of line the walls to some extent. I think you see them. Yeah. So it's, I think it's hard to tell, but they might be. They seem to be a bunch of them, certainly. Yeah. But on the other hand, they're at the edge, they're by the window, they're, you can still look out the window, the sport left there. It's interesting, the instruments and the, the chairs are certainly very European. That's about the chandeliers. But the chandeliers are replicas of a gift from the royalty of France. Of France, okay, yeah. They're cheap replicas. Okay. Some people would object, it's not real crystal, it's glass, oh, okay. um, and they should have just held out. Um, but the chairs are replicas of 19th century chairs. But see, this is the, the challenge of this, is because uh, to our eye, it's Dutch, it's French, it's British, uh, it's so foreign, it's so alien, and yet it has been javanized. And so I would never admit it to Prince Deepo Kusumo. Uh, with him, when I'm talking with him, I would insist that you must uphold the highest standards and not allow these air conditioning units to invade the space. But, um, but then secretly, just between us in this room, I suspect it's probably just fine. They're going to do fine. They do some wacky stuff that I don't understand, but that's why I'm a gringo. 
and they're not. That's what makes me a foreigner. And uh, uh, they've been doing fine for several centuries, and uh, hopefully they'll continue. But it's an interesting question of what role we take on as professionals. I was much happier with the role I took on uh, being critical of Williamsburg, Virginia. Now, there's something that they should grant authority to me as someone who grew up visiting Sturbridge Village and loving it, and Mystic Seaport, and loving it. And despite, or maybe because of how much I loved those reenactments of history, recognizing how totally inappropriate it would be to crucify the living culture of this palace in order to resurrect it again as a living museum. So the palace still functions, right? The palace still functions. You still have a lot of the family living there? I mean, I'm sure some have moved out. But, uh... Well, each of the six, uh, they're, they're really four very distinct factions. I was proud of the fact that I got them all together in a single room to talk about this project. Mm -hmm. And I was told uh, after the fact that this was the first time that all of them had ever been in the same room together. Because they were at war with each other. And it was like Game of Thrones kind of thing. Uh, and one of the four factions won, and the other three factions moved out. Um, and so the faction that won actually is the faction that with the development contracting mm -hmm. company. And so they have been proceeding through the process of uh, restoration. When, when the building business of the new subdivisions outside of town slows down, they send their crew into the palace and they mm -hmm. put in bathroom tile as flooring, it's things that I find quite objectionable. Mm -hmm. But who am I? What do I know? But I guess the minister, Mio Bave, who supported this and made it happen, mm -hmm. must have thought he was doing a good, he was doing a good cultural deed because um, absolutely. Was Sukarta? Is it, was um, Suharta? No, was Surakarta. Surakarta is gone. I don't think so. No, I'm not sure where he was from. But he was half Dutch. Yeah, I mean, he was this. Six foot six Indonesian. Yeah, he's a tall, big, big guy. I used to spend a certain amount of time with him actually. Yeah, he spent quite a lot of time. For some reason. Yeah. Well, he's always there. Because he's always there. He's at every party. <laughs> he's every everything. He's all with all the foreigners. He's yeah. Traveling. He's very. He's, he's a party animal. He was. That's true. But one of the other interesting things that I confronted was um, uh, they came to me and they said, um, at this stage, and they said, um, I was raising the question with the royal uh, carpenters. So how do we um, patch the, you know, the, the gaps in the wood. And they said, oh, we use Bondo. I said, no. What do you mean, Bondo? You mean like auto body putty? And they said, yeah, it works great. It's the best thing. And I said, absolutely not. Or I started with that. I was trying that out. You know, I'm the, I'm the wood, ec I'm the, the professional, design professional. And I actually grew up uh, repairing historic wood houses uh, as my summer job. And I you know, learned a lot about how wood behaves, expanding and contracting. That It's not just the living community. These materials are living. This wood is alive, and it expands and it contracts, and it moves. And Bondo works so well because it's absolutely rigid, and it doesn't budge, and it doesn't let go uh, when it's on a steel car because steel doesn't do an awful lot of expanding and contracting uh, in the context of Bondo. 
or at least not so much that it, the Bondo gives up, the paint can hold it. And so I said, that, well, that's, that's just not going to happen. And in the end, I said, they, I said, okay, I had to confront my own value system. And I said, do I really want to be the foreigner telling these, the royal carpenter, what he has to do? And I said, you know, hey, if you say it works, let's try it. If you Assuming came, that it would fail. Yeah, if you came across the situation in the United States, mm -hmm. I mean, you felt a foreigner, and therefore you... I acquiesced. To their values and their yeah. way of doing something. I was Javanese. Would you do the, <laughs> would you do the same thing here? Well... If you suddenly went to Newport Mansions and they said, we're going to use um, plastic coating. Well, here I, was, um, I would get a second opinion. I would refer to the academic research, uh, coming out of Iqlaam. And why couldn't you do that in, in the, I suppose you didn't have access to that stuff. Well, there was no internet. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. And I could have written letters. Um, three months later. Three months <laughs> later, you know. That's interesting, too. Uh, but I, I just didn't have the resources. And uh, I learned to trust these people who were my collaborators. And he said, it's going to work fine. And, that's, and I actually quite proud of myself how quickly I, you know, once I felt that they understood what I was saying, that wood expands and contracts. And his response, and he's a very sharp team of people, and his response was, it's going to be fine. You know, my, I felt my job was to be understood. And then, just like in the King situation, I said, you understand, these are the colors that Aquabuano the Tenth used at the high point of the golden, so-called golden era. Um, if, uh, if this were another situation, these are the colors we would go with. But this is not another situation. You are the, at the, the pinnacle of the living culture. We defer to whatever you say. And so in a way, it was, it was that challenge that I had to overcome my professional expertise and become a supportive, to become, and I learned around that time that you don't empower people, you don't empower communities, you simply refrain from disempowering them. They have power innately. You simply refrain from the crime of disempowering people. And so I was focusing at that time on refraining, seizing opportunities to not disempower people, to allow them to maintain their autonomy, because that was what I identified as being the most important thing I could do. I almost started to feel, and I started to say it, forget about the buildings. Let the buildings crumble and you know, bulldoze them and put up a parking lot. We don't care. The buildings are only important insofar as they perform the ultimate task of serving as a vehicle for cultural values that remain meaningful to society, to the world, to this society. And it could be that by venerating the building so much that it undermines the living culture and thus is, uh, is counterproductive. And so that's ultimately how I decided that Bondo go for it. And I went back and the Bondo worked great. Hmm. It's two is okay after one. Because the humidity, it's not just the temperature that is predictably 98 degrees every day. The humidity fluctuates between 89% and 100%. And that's it. And so that's why when you import furniture from Java, in the middle of the night, you hear an explosion and it's, your table has contracted, it dried up, and it finally, finally blew up. <laughs> and there's a huge crack down the middle of your table now. Because that piece of wood never dreamed that it would ever be asked to exist in, a, in an environment drier than 89% humidity. I had relatives that did that. What important furniture from that? 
Really? Yeah. And they had a humidifier with closed doors. And right. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was so stupid. Like, why would you even bother? Because they heard the story of the exploding tank. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, they, they started to crack one day. So they knew have it on. on. Yeah, so they kept it human. Like, oh my God. Yeah. It might not have been from them, but one of the you know more humid countries in that part of Europe. Yeah. Well, it could very well. It's a very popular place to import teak from. Yeah. So I guess, you know, it is, um, I think what's important to, again, realize is that there's no right or wrong necessarily in preservation, and it does depend upon the situation and the values. And the bigger questions that are raised is, is you know, who are you preserving it for and why? Not everything, maybe not everything should be preserved. Things can die. Some things get preserved, some things get changed. And we've got very obsessed, and I, I think that one of the problems that um, preservationists have had is that they've said, this is the right way to do things, and this is how we should do it. And architects have had the opposite in a way, and said, look, you guys are just wanting to preserve everything, you're not going to let us help change and change and build new stuff on it. And the thing is that they don't necessarily understand what the history of the building and what it means. And on the other hand, the preservationists don't understand that change is, is inevitable and maybe necessary. So we've got this, it's getting better. The conversation is happening between architect, preservationists, and the people who are going to you know, Again, whose values are you thinking about? So I think this question of what do you preserve, why do you preserve it, and for whom? which raises much bigger cultural questions. It's not just about the techniques. I mean, it is about the techniques as well. And there is good practice. It's not saying there isn't good practice. Um, but you know, how, do you, how do you do this thing? And it's built into the terminology historic preservation. Yeah. Uh, in the rest of the world, that term is not popular. Uh, in the rest of the world, conservation is the term. Yeah. Michelle, when Michelle Lampikos came and talked a few weeks ago, and she began to began by saying, "Look at that!" And this, it has different connotations because one sort of suggests a more static process, and one suggests a more evolving and changing process. So it's, it's true. I've got a thesis student at the moment who's probably she's doing her HP final project as well, which is Alison. And she's doing a thesis with me in terms of um, the architecture piece. She's an architect and historic preservationist. And we're having this con conversation about how do you add to a building? And the, you know, how do you touch it? How do you show what is between? So she uses all the principles that the Venice Charter, which we talked, we just right. started about the Charter. And she says, mm -hmm. she begins to use those principles as to what the Venice Charter says how the Venice Charter suggests, um, you know, you differentiate between the old and the new, the reversibility, don't damage the old. And you have this conversation, and she's really having this conversation about how does she want to add to a new, and there's been two blocks. The architects say, if you really want to respect the building, just only touch the building with a very small piece of preservations too. On the other hand, there are others who say maybe you could add to the building and, and touch the building, but it's back to the old um, the Duke. As long as the building is not hidden and you can reveal the wholeness of it, why not? You know? So it's an interesting sort of think about this building. We added a new, new part to the front of the building. It's not a historic building, but the same principle. We, what was the external wall is now an internal wall. So what does that mean to us? Is it? But it, so, it so, sort of shows the history of the building. It says, this was, and now we are this, but the external wall is still, we still read it as, a, as not an internal wall. It's not an external anyway. So this question about what do you do, what are the decisions, and I think the other thing that comes out is that the decisions that you make in terms of preservation are really dependent on each of the situations. And what may be right in one place may be actually unacceptable and wrong in another. 
And that, in a way, that's the narrative of the sequence of charters that you were started that's looking right. at last week, is that uh, in the 90s, all of a sudden, there's the, the NARA charter uh, that acknowledges uh, that there are there's living cultures, mm -hmm. traditions. And then you have charters that acknowledge cultural landscapes. Uh, and so that in a way, that's the narrative, is that there's assumptions of principles that emerge very clearly from a Western Eurocentric context. And as preservation and conservation practice uh, is confronted by other situations in the rest of the world, it compels a rethinking of the values and the principles, uh, and it's not easy. Most of our charters are sort of reactive to something. That is the Hague, Hague Convention to War, Venice to Destruction at a Certain Moment in Time, the Biochar to Aboriginal, Aborigines, Maori to Culture. I mean, we uh, normally we look at a whole bunch of charters, but this time we only looked at a few people, so we had fewer charters to look at. Oh, okay. So we, you looked at the highlighted ones. We looked so at the highlighted ones in the syllabus. Only those ones. But, uh, so normally I try and get some more mm -hmm. local ones as well, the Indian and the Indonesian roles and this and that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but it does reveal what the, the accumulation and the changes are over time. Yeah. And tourism is adds another yeah, thing. The other one I mean, one of the things that I was able to do mm -hmm. in, in making my argument uh, was that uh, uh, I'm not an expert. I, I'm the outsider. But if you, at the time, there was uh, a fascination for the tourism potential of all of this. And I very much pointed to the growing sophistication of tourists and how uh, tourists these days um, are not interested in beach, you know, sun and sand. You know, if they're coming to Java, if they're going to go travel all this way to come to Java, they're not coming for sun and sand, you know, quick tour. They're interested in uh, the question of authenticity. And they are going to smell a mile away anything that was done uh, for their consumption, for the purposes of pleasing tourists. And so making it shiny and new, I can't find what I'm looking for, but making it shiny and new uh, is not necessarily what's going to draw people to to come there, but uh, something that feels like it is authentically continuing something that they would not otherwise be able to have access to, uh, that's going to draw people. The Williamsburg model is uh, going to repel people because when we travel to other places, one of the first things we're concerned about is we, and I'm saying North Americans, we are concerned about what impact we're having because we, we don't want to disturb and, and degrade uh, the situation. And a living museum in the Williamsburg model would very clearly send a message. Uh, and if the story got out that the Williamsburg model displaced the royal family and we put an end to the actual authentic ritual traditions, uh, that would be mark against uh, that as an appealing destination for tourists. And that the most appealing destinations for tourists would be the ones where, by visiting, their hotel and their contributions were contributing at, uh, actually to the ongoing preservation process. And that uh, the right thing to do is to uh, renew the buildings as slowly as possible and as painstakingly as possible, 17 out of 20 years of the Issei Shrine would be about right uh, to make this an ongoing process of renewal 
so that people can feel good about their visit. 